recording class. There we go, so we're recording. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do a knowledge check. And this knowledge check can be found on Blackboard, uh, the Word document, so you can make notes like last time. And um, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, it's not as big as the previous class, uh, which is good because um, after this, we're going to go into a bit of an exercise around um, account types and account examples. Okay, so that that's going to help us have a better idea of how, uh, or have a better idea of which accounts are being affected through various transactions and where we put that money. Okay, um, and then we're going to go into we're going to start talking about uh, posting to a ledger and taking a trial balance. Okay, so I've got another worksheet that we're going to uh, work with. Okay, so I'm going to um, I'm going to show you what a ledger is, how you post to it, uh, and how to take a trial balance. And then I'm going to bring up a worksheet. I'm going to share my screen, and then I'm going to actually do it. Okay, um, you can follow along if you'd like, or you can complete it. Um, you know, uh, tonight or, or or tomorrow, we'll have this particular worksheet due on on Friday. Okay, so you can submit this worksheet by um, Friday of midnight. Okay. So, does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns before we get going? Anybody excited for the Leafs and the Habs hockey game today? Go Habs! No. Dang, Paul, go leaves go. Thank you. And Danny, sorry to interrupt. I think the knowledge check under class four is the one from the previous class. It is. If you scroll down, um, class three. Yeah, if you scroll down, um, what is it called? It it says class three. So it's from the previous uh, from the previous class. Okay, awesome. This Friday or the following Friday? This Friday. I mean, you can follow, uh, Vanessa, you can follow along and do it with me as I'm doing it. Uh, there's also a video posted to Blackboard of me doing exactly what I'm going to do here in class. Okay, so if you're getting stuck, uh, things like that. Yeah, so it, you get it uh, Friday by midnight. just gives you an extra day to get it done just in case you can't follow uh, as I'm doing it. Um, some people have different kind of, uh, computer setups and stuff. But yeah, no, excited about the hockey game tonight. Um, I think the Leafs have been doing fairly well this season. I'm like a diehard Leafs fan. I don't know why. Uh, I don't know why. Obviously, I live near Toronto. I think it was because like all of my aunts and my dad and everyone, they were all Leafs fans. So I kind of inherited. Uh, this knowledge check have to be submitted to? No, no, it's just for your own notes taking. Almost like a study guide, if you will. Awesome. Um, so yeah, let's get started here. Um, no problem. Question number one: um, What are the first three steps in the accounting cycle talked about on Tuesday? The first three steps. Good afternoon, Kinsada. What are the first three steps in the accounting cycle? What do you think? Throw it in the chat. Okay. And uh, Mary Ellen would be pretty much correct. Uh, and Vanessa, to, to, for the most part, yes. Um, the first step in the accounting cycle is where we identify business transactions or conduct a transactional and uh, transactional analysis to make sure it is in fact a business transaction. So we have to make sure value was given and received through um, a particular transaction. Once we have identified uh, or collected uh, business transactions, we then, uh, to Vanessa's point, record and Mary Ellen's point in the journal. So we record all of those transactions in the general journal, which is also known as the um, book of original entry. Okay, and then the third step, uh, again to Mary Ellen's point, is to post to the general ledger. So those are the first three steps. 
Uh, we do a transactional analysis to make sure all the uh, make sure all of our transactions are business transactions. We post to a journal, and then we post to the general ledger. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, um, and then the next couple steps, uh, or the next step, which would be step four, is taking a trial balance. So we're going to be we're going to be covering steps three and four by the end of this class. Okay. Um, question number two. Or sorry, before I before I continue, did anybody uh, does anybody have any questions I can help answer, or was that fairly straightforward? What do you think? No questions. All right. So question number two, what are the three types of accounts found on a balance sheet? So we want to know what are the three account types found on a balance sheet statement? Remember, your balance sheet is a financial statement that shows financial position or financial health of a business. It doesn't show uh, uh, profit, income, costs, or financial performance. So what are the other three types of accounts we have? Yeah, Paul, absolutely. Assets. Liabilities, TG, assets, liabilities, and equity accounts. Remember, um, and then, sorry, on your balance sheet, uh, your assets must equal your liabilities plus your equity. Good. And then, as an extension of that, what are the two main types of accounts that are found on income statements? And remember that income statements are a financial statement that shows financial performance and profit is the measure of financial performance. Absolutely, revenues and expenses or sales and costs. So they're, they're kind of interchangeable. And if we take our sales, we subtract our costs or expenses, we get our profit, which again is the, um, uh, the golden standard for uh, financial performance. Then question number four, what is the general journal? Yeah, Maria, that sums it up pretty well. It's used. It's a it's a a sheet or a um, some some sort of way to record or track business transactions. Yep, record um, oh, transactions, oh. Vanessa, um, using debits and credits or the rules of debits and credits. Absolutely. And um, then question number five: How would you decide if a business transaction has occurred? How would we decide if a business transaction has occurred? Yes, Mary Ellen, absolutely. And uh, when we're when we're when we're looking at that, or we're we're trying to make up exactly Vanessa, um, we're we're looking um, to see if value was given and received. We're also looking to see if there's a source document, right? Because that's the proof that a business transaction has occurred. And while we're doing those things. We're conducting a transactional analysis, so absolutely, which um, is the first step in the accounting cycle. 
Question number six, what is, uh, what side of the T account or which column do we find the debit column on the left or on the right? Yes, debit always left, credit always right. <laughs> Absolutely, good job. And then um, in accounting, your debits must also equal what? Blank. Your debits must also always equal your blank. Yeah, Paul, your credits. Absolutely. Your debits must always equal your credits. Um, uh, if we, and this, this, the reason why our debits must equal our credits is because of dual entry accounting. Again, um, if there's a change to one account, it must change another, right? That's why we, if we increase an asset, we must also increase either a liability, equity, or both. Um, and then why else? Uh, yes, Paul. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, so since there's a double entry uh, method, is there a single entry method? Is that a thing? Um, no. Okay, I so that's literally just the only way. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, because if your um, transactions, they, they deal with money going somewhere, right? There's a value given and a value received. Um, if you're receiving value, you have to give it as well. So to, to receive value, you must also decrease value. And that's all, it's coming from in sure. within. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Um, and then what else here? What are some examples of business transactions? Okay, Vanessa, yep, yeah. if a business transaction happened, we would have an invoice, totally. Um, try and think what the invoice is implying, right? The invoice is implying you're, you're buying something, right? Uh, Paul, yep, yeah. you're, you're purchasing equipment, 100%. That would be a business transaction. Making a sale, also. Uh, purchases, yep. Yeah. Maybe not necessarily costings, but, you know, purchasing food inventory would be a transaction. Um, purchasing beverage inventory. And again, when you're thinking about examples of transactions, um, think about your person, your own uh, personal life. When you go buy something or when you sell something, that's a transaction. Uh, it's really the only two transactions that can happen, you buying something or you selling something, right? Um, and then, yeah. So yeah, uh, paying, uh, paying your wages, Paul, paying rent, absolutely. All good examples. And then, uh, do, 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 do. and then number nine, okay. How does each account type change with a debit or credit? So I'm, I'm gonna ask this in maybe a different way. How do we increase an asset account? On which side, debit or credit? Exactly, Justin. With our assets, they increase on the debit side and they decrease with credits. Great. Now, if we remember that our assets, sorry, I'm just going to write this in. If we remember that our assets equal liabilities plus our equity, then however our asset accounts behave, our liabilities and equity exactly Paul are behave in the opposite way okay so with that in mind how do our liabilities and equity accounts behave how do, which side do they increase on exactly they increase on the credit side and then they uh, they decrease on the uh, on the debit side Absolutely. Um, what about expenses? Um, how do you show an increase to an expense account on the debit side or the credit side? Uh, 
Yes, absolutely, a debit entry. Uh, we show increase, increases to asset accounts through debit entries, and we decrease asset accounts through credit entries. And then because, um, what is it, uh, sorry, our, our expenses and our revenues are pretty much opposite things, right? Uh, expenses are monetary outflows, whereas revenues or sales are monetary inflows, they're opposites. Um, how do we show an increase to a revenue account on the debit or the credit side? Vanessa, our expenses increase on the debit side. And if our revenues are opposite, then our revenue accounts must increase on the credit side. Um, yeah, so fairly well done. That was pretty good. Yeah, it, it, Vanessa, it, it, is, it is very easy to get these mixed up. Very easy. Um, I remember when I was learning them in my undergrad, it was like, you know, oh, my God, there's so many rules. But if you remember which one, if you remember your assets, the rules that you use for your assets, then whatever, um, then you remember you should be able to remember what's happening or the rules for your liabilities and equity because they're the opposite. You just flip them, and then if you remember for your opposite, uh, sorry, your expenses, you just flip those rules for your revenues. That's that's a good point, Mary. That, that could be a good way to think about it, right? Your assets and your revenues behave um, being an asset, so the rules are the same. Well, assets increase on the debit side, though. Yeah, assets and expenses are the same. All the rest are the opposite, totally. And I think uh, somebody uh, somebody mentioned that as well. Let me just go up in the chat here. I think it was Paul. Oh, I can't seem to find it. But yeah, so assets and expenses, uh, they behave the same. The rest are opposite. Also, in the class three materials, that there's that little chart there that shows you all of the rules of debits and credits. Um, so uh, maybe print that chart off and then just keep it beside you when you're doing anything accounting. <laughs> good job, everyone. That was, that was good. So um, and then when we're talking about journalizing, which is some of the activities that we did last week, uh, we're going to continue with some today because I, that's, it's kind of the first step in the uh, second step in the accounting process. But it's the first time that you'll use rules and debits and credits. I, I want to make sure that that's really strong with everybody. Uh, you have to you have to ask your, some, yourself some questions when you're journalizing, or keep some things in mind, right? First, you want to ask yourself. I'll bring the pen here. Go with the new rule. Understood. Yeah, very good. Absolutely. Or maybe even what I could maybe if it'll be useful, I can create a list, right? So I can put. Um, uh, debit increase, credit decrease, and then I can put asset accounts and then expense accounts, and then I can put the rules for the rest of them under almost like a, a different way, a, a, just a, a different way of showing. So maybe I'll try and put that up after. So when you're journalizing, you got to keep a couple things in mind or ask yourself some questions. First, based on a particular transaction, what two or three accounts are being affected? Okay. Typically, it's only two accounts being affected, okay? In some cases, there are things that we call compound entries where three or more accounts are being affected. But don't worry, you won't see those until, you won't see those until we go over payroll. So it's all good. Um, for your assignment number one, you're only gonna see an entry that, um, what is it? You're only going to have two account entries, or two account transactions, but you have to correctly pick which account you need to change, right? Or what two accounts are being affected for a given transaction. Typically speaking, 
then uh, the accounts are kind of implied in the description of the um, of the transaction itself. For example, if you're buying something, if you're purchasing something, you're you're spending money. It's going to affect cash, but did you actually pay cash? If you did, then you would debit cash, or sorry, credit cash, or it would be affecting cash. And if you bought something but you didn't actually pay any cash yet, it would affect a payable, right? Sales, on the other hand, another common uh, transaction is uh, obviously your revenue account is being affected because it's sales, and it could affect your your cash account if you receive the cash for it. But if you haven't received cash for that particular sale, it would be affecting your accounts receivable. Okay. Um, you're also typically given a chart of accounts, which is a, a list of all the accounts a particular business have has, and all of those uh, those accounts are, are listed on your assignment number one. So you'll have the name of all the accounts you have access to um, there. Um, and after you've asked yourself, okay, which two accounts are being affected here? You need to ask yourself, how are they being affected, right? Is this account increasing or is it decreasing? Typically, if you're generating sales, if it's a sales transaction, both accounts are typically being increased, okay? If you're purchasing something, right, your cash might be going down or your payables might be going up. And whatever you, the account of whatever you're purchasing is obviously going up because you're purchasing it, right? So you have to ask yourself, do I have more or less of this, right? And then once you've figured out what accounts are being affected, how they're being affected through either increases or decreases, you apply the rules of debits and credits in order to journalize or post that transaction in your journal. And then after you've posted, in the journal, excuse me, you look at your journal and go, do my debits equal my credits, right? And they always should. Um, and if you're doing these four things, you've probably journalized correctly, okay? Now, uh, does anybody have any questions I can help answer before we go on to, I wanna, I would just wanna go over the account types again and give some examples of a, a specific accounts that would fall under each type. Or put a thumbs up in the chat if you're if you're good to continue. Would there be a situation where expenses and revenues are being affected? Um I'm trying to think. I don't think so. Not that I can really think of. Um, there could be, <coughs> there are some things called what we call contra accounts. I'm just going to write that. So contra. There are things called contra accounts. There's not too many of them, thankfully. And these accounts, while they, okay, say we, say we have, okay, uh, how would I, within revenue accounts, okay, there's obviously you have your sales lines, you also have a discount line, okay, in, in some cases, not all cases, and a, a discount is what we call a contra revenue account because it behaves opposite of how most revenue, how all revenue accounts behave. Um, and you could think about it as almost an expense because um, because it behaves oppositely, but it's technically not an expense. So we'd be hard pressed to find an, um, a situation where one transaction is affecting both an expense and sales, I think. Charles. Good question. It was interesting. 
All right, so I'm going to put up a different sheet now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it, it's interesting that we're that you all have really cool and unique questions because you've there's some things in in accounting. There's there's rules. There's the rules, right? And while there are some loopholes, it's interesting to get people different people's perspective because it kind of highlights you know what could happen or what if in accounting. So it's really interesting. Thank you. Um, oh, I didn't upload it. Give me 30 seconds here. I'm just going to upload the file that I wanted to. Actually, it's not there. I can put it here. I did not. What was it called? Uh, sorry, give me 30 seconds here. Count. I may have. There we go. This is accounting week 201B, week 2B. I can't see it. Sorry, but I'm just trying to find. There we go. That's really weird how that's not showing up. There we go. Okay, it's uploading now. So I uploaded um, a file under this week and last week's materials called Account Type Definitions and Examples. So here we go. Um, so firstly, assets. Assets are tangible or intangible business resources that produce value for the business in the future. Okay. Um, I think we've kind of gone over that definition before, uh, which is great. But I wanted to give, I think the more important thing here is some examples of asset accounts. Okay, And I, I want to give a definition around some of them. Your cash is the amount of money you have in the bank. Okay, So it's your money. Um, fairly straightforward, it's, it's your money. Okay, Accounts receivable. Can anybody remind, uh, remind us what accounts receivable are? Exactly, Vanessa. So your accounts receivable are essentially sales that you have not collected yet, right? So the, it's the amount of money that people owe you from your sales. Awesome. And then the value of uh, your, your, your equipment account is kind of an umbrella account for the value of all of the equipment that you have within a business, okay? What are some pieces of equipment that a, a food business would have? Ovens, 100%. What else? Meat slicer, absolutely. A very handy piece of equipment, by the way. Also slightly terrifying. What else do we have? We have ranges. We have cold drops. We have, uh, you know, Bain Marie's. Um, things like that. Uh, the Robo Coop, absolutely. The Robo Coop, the workhorse of the kitchen, absolutely. Uh, my other favorite is um, we have this giant, massive immersion blender for soups and dressings. So good. Uh, deep fryers, exactly. One of my favorite things to cook with because I love to deep fry stuff because I'm fat. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, these are all pieces of equipment that the business owns and um, and our, our, our equipment account would include the value or the cost of all of those pieces of equipment. Inventories, another asset account, right? And this is the value of all of the inventories that we have. And uh, inventories are typically supplies that we need in order to conduct business. So in food business, or food service, 
We typically have food inventories. Uh, we have beverage inventories. We also have operational supplies. What happens when inventory appreciates? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, aging cheese, for example. Um, <clears throat> it's hard to tell. I don't think um, you, in our industry, you can't necessarily uh, you can't necessarily increase the value of your inventory. It goes against um, the conservative conservatism principle. Um, in fact, in order to be on the line with conservatism, you would use the um, the lowest of the possible costs or the most recent cost. Uh, I'm not sure what happens. Yeah, there are things um, there are things that appreciate in value. Um, for example, uh, land can, but you have to you have to uh, have it evaluated. Will it fluctuate like stock? Uh, it wouldn't fluctuate like a stock. No, um, the cost stays the same um, because we have to show it as a historical cost. The, uh, the value on our uh, balance sheet is the cost that we paid for the product. The, the the price or the sales price, on the other hand, that can change as much as we want it to, and that that could be where the the appreciation, if you will, comes into play. But it it's not really a matter of cost. Um, so yeah, we have tons of inventories, and within food business, our inventories are really unique. Uh, it was an interesting point, yeah. Um, our inventories are really unique because opposed to manufacturing, for example, making cars, um, our inventories can go bad, right? Um, but steel within cars or other things can't go bad. So uh, our inventories are particularly unique. We also have land. So this would be the value of any land that we um, that we own or use for the business. Uh, I think the other week I gave an example of Bench Brewery in uh, Lincoln <coughs> or the, the 20 Valley. They, they purchased the land and the, the, the schoolhouse that they now use for their brewery. Um, so yeah, that would be in their, their land account or the value of that land. Um, well, the, the only other asset account I would bring to your attention or would mention here would be depreciation. Okay, so Paul mentioned appreciation or how the value of something goes up or appreciates. We also have, on the other hand, depreciation, which is, go, uh, which is value going down, right? Depreciation is essentially devaluing uh, pieces of equipment over the course of its useful life. And the reason we do this is to show that as time progresses, our equipment is becoming less useful. Eventually, because we are, we're using it over the course of time, we're not going to be able to use it at some point because it's going to break or it's going to be really old, right? Depreciation is, an ex, uh, is, is uh, we have a depreciation expense, but we have a contra asset account called accumulated depreciation which we'll talk about in a couple of classes, um, like Toronto. So expensive for the land. Yeah, absolutely. But um, with our equipment, uh, could you have depreciation under the liabilities category? Uh, Mary Ellen, no, but it does behave uh, because it's a contra account, a contra asset account. Your, your accumulated depreciation behaves like a liability. For example, you increase uh, you increase your accumulated depreciation on the credit side instead of the debit side. And as time progresses, the amount of depreciation that's accumulated increases and it decreases the net value of your equipment, right? Um, Again, we do this for one reason, to show that uh, you know, over the course of time, the value of our, our equipment is actually decreasing because we're using it, but also because uh, depreciation is also an expense. So we have de accumulated depreciation, but we also have to show that it's an expense. So 
depreciation also is the uh, allocation of an asset's cost over the course of its useful life, right? So we're spreading out the cost of that asset over the course of its life. And what that does for us uh, is it reduces our operating income by the amount of the depreciation, whereby decreasing the amount of taxes that we pay, which gives businesses uh, incentives to invest into, you know, uh, pieces of equipment, uh, things that will make their business run. Okay. Um, don't get uh, too hung up on that just yet. We will talk about depreciation and how to calculate it when we go over adjusting entries next week. I just kind of wanted a little whisper in your ear as to what depreciation is. Okay. Do, 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 why is it doing that? So now we've done assets. Let's do liabilities. Oh, I've got a. So liabilities. Hey, here, everybody. Sorry, I'm just going to close my window here because they're, somebody's mowing their lawn. Hold on. Oh, it's rather hard to do. There we go. Um, so liabilities, uh, as a general definition, uh, this is creditors' claims to business assets or short and long-term financial obligations of a business. Okay. Some examples would include accounts payable, which are the opposite of accounts receivable. Based on that idea, can anyone give us a, just a general definition about what accounts payable are? Exactly, Vanessa. Absolutely. It's, <laughs> it's costs that we haven't paid yet. Or, uh, yeah, it's costs that we haven't paid yet or people that we owe money to. It's kind of an umbrella term for, um, for that, right? So we had mentioned uh, on Tuesday that whenever you purchase uh, supplies like food, inventory, beverage inventory, operational supplies, you typically don't have to pay right away. You have to pay within 30 days. So that transaction, instead of affecting cash, affects your accounts payable because, um, yes, you've purchased an asset, but you have not uh, paid for that, that those assets, whether it's food, beverage, uh, you, know, you get it. Wage payable, and remember, if you see the word payable after any account, accounts, yes, exactly. Uh, accounts payable are short-term liabilities, 100%. Um, we generally define uh, or differentiate between short and long-term liabilities, whether they're due within, um, uh, within one operating year, and 30 days is within one operating year, so absolutely. Um, your wage is payable, or sorry, before I continue with that, if you see the word payable before any account name, or sorry, after any account name, it means that you have not paid that yet. Any payable is a short-term liability, meaning that you have not paid that yet. So your wage is payable, by that definition, are wages that you have not paid your staff yet, because it's not, uh, it's not payday, right? You can also have salaries payable, okay, which are salaries that you have not paid yet. You can have interest payable, which is interest that you have not paid yet. Uh, what else? I can't think of any more examples right now. Um, you can also, as a liability, have bank loans, and this is the value of the principal of your bank loan. Okay, and your bank loan is typically a long-term liability because you don't have to pay it back within one operating year. And then lines of credit. Line of credit is very similar to uh, to bank loans, uh, except that it, it's a bit different. You don't pay you don't pay interest on the entire principal. You pay interest on the amount that uh, of the line that you used. Okay, and again, it's a long-term liability because you don't have to pay it back within one year. Okay. 
So if I had to kind of sum up what liabilities are, if you have not paid something yet, it's a liability. If you, ha uh, if you do have to pay something in the long term, like a bank loan or something like that, um, the, uh, it's, it's typically a liability. So our bank loans are typically just the principal. Uh, yes, because we uh, most bank loans are fully utilized, which means fully used when we get them, like long-term business loans. That's why we increase cash when we get a bank loan. Absolutely. Does that make sense, Marianne? Yes, that's correct. Absolutely. And then there in, in lies the difference between loans and lines of credit. On loans, your interest is calculated on the principal, which is fully utilized, which means that if you're getting a $100,000 loan for your business, you now have an extra $100,000 in cash, and your interest is being calculated on $100,000. Um, a line of credit, however, your own, your, say you went and got a $100,000 line of credit. You don't have to use 100% of that $100,000. You can only you can you only need to use you only use what you need, and then say you only use 10,000 of that 100,000. Then your only your interest is only calculated on the 10,000, opposed to the whole 100,000. So it's a bit more flexibility. Uh, and a separate category for interest um, is that coming next week with uh, adjusting? Yes. Well, we do. Um, Yes, we can differentiate between the two lines of interest. So, line uh, interest for the lines uh, for the line of credit payable, or bank loan interest payable. Um, and yes, that is coming next week with an adjusting entry. Absolutely. Very good. Good job, everybody. So continuing here. So, owner's equity, probably the hardest to define, is the owner's claim to business assets, or any owner's stake or investment in the business. So if you were to start a business and you were to put $100,000 of your own money into the business and starting it up, then you have $100,000 uh, $100, worth of owner's equity or equity in the business. There are some examples here of some accounts that will fall under the owner's equity section. Or yeah, first is retained earnings, which is uh, it is the accumulation of profit over time. So it's just a uh, how much profit you've made over time. Okay. There's your common stock. Okay, so this is uh, your common stock is typically um, is typically an account that we would find in corporations. Okay, and your common stock is your individual investment. In the business okay for example if you were investing a hundred thousand dollars into a business your cash would go down by a hundred uh, by a hundred thousand dollars and your capital stock would go up by a hundred thousand dollars because it right it's your investment in the business so that's your stock of the business we also have dividends and dividends are the amount of money that are paid out to stockholders for a particular period um, dividends actually decrease owner's equity because it's equity that's being taken out of the business. And then there's treasury stock, which we will talk about a lot. <laughs> we will talk a lot uh, later in the course about. Uh, treasury stock is is not common for many small and medium businesses. Uh, treasury stock is the amount of the amount of all of the stock or shares that a business has sold, but also, but then purchased back from shareholders, right? So if you wanted to reduce the amount of shareholders that you have and you bought their shares back, you would be creating treasury stock. Treasury stock is you buying your stock back from your shareholders. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> All right. <coughs> so revenues. We may have uh, talked a lot about this, but revenues are a monetary inflow of cash or equivalents as a result of providing or selling a, um, what is it called, a, a service or a product. Some examples we have here are food sales from the sale of food products, beverage sales for 
the sale of alcoholic beverages and, and catering sales. We can also have uh, revenues, uh, sorry, revenue. We can also have uh, retail sales if we have a retail store, right? And expenses are the opposite of revenues. These again are a monetary outflow of a resource resulting uh, as a result of generating sales. Some example uh, are the wage expense, and that's us paying our wages. Uh, rent expense for us paying our rent. Utilities expenses for uh, paying our utility bills, right? And we can also have bad debts, bad debts expense. Does anybody want to take a stab at what a bad debts expense could be? Pretty good guess, just uh, Vanessa. Um, if, uh, I can take a piece of that. Absolutely, your bad debts expense is the amount of money that you will not be able to collect from uh, your receivables. So, your accounts receivable is all of the money that people owe you, and your bad debts expense is the amount of money that you are estimating you will not be able to collect of those accounts receivable. Um, Accounts receivable, um, there is a bit of a risk to it. Um, all businesses have, most businesses have accounts receivable, but some customers do not pay, right? Some customers pin 30 days, some customers pay within 60 days, um, some pay, customers pay within 90 days, which is not good, and then some people just don't pay at all. When we cannot collect on an accounts receivable, we then expense it to write it off. So we don't, uh, we, we're just acknowledging that we will not be able to collect 100% of our revenues. Uh, so if you're a supplier and the restaurant goes bankrupt, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes, that would, ex that would definitely cause a bad debt. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, in some cases, you can collect from a company that goes bankrupt, but it's the difference between being an unsecured or a secured creditor, right? An unsecured creditor, much like a supplier, is uh, will not be able to go uh, and they may get a little bit from a bankruptcy, but they won't get all of what they're owed. Most of what is owed to others in a bankruptcy goes to uh, a business's, a bankrupt business's secured creditors. So these are people who have leverage or, um, oh, what's the word? Not leverage. I forget what the word is, but they have um, a written agreement that they would, they're in position to get in the event of a bankruptcy, they get their money first, right? For example, banks usually are secured creditors with, uh, with bank loans. Um, you, can, uh, you can even use um, uh, pieces of, for example, your accounts receivable as uh, leverage to get a bank loan in the event that they, you go bankrupt. The, the company will just come in and take over your receivables and collect them. Or you can use your inventories to secure um, um, bank loans. And in fact, I forget who it was. It was Paul, I believe, that was talking about the appreciation on cheese. Um, what's interesting I've heard is that, you know how uh, Parmesan is made over many, many years and how par Parmesan is really, really expensive? Parmesan companies, like the actual Italian Parmesan companies, they use the value of the future value of their cheese in order to secure bank loans, which is crazy. Uh, yes, Vanessa. Thank you, Professor. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to clarify something. So when you say winner, let's say when you have a secure credit and the business goes bankrupt, for example, um, the bank, let's say it was a bank loan and the bank has just come in and claimed the building and the restaurant because it has some value that they cannot take in money terms or in money. So they claim the restaurant itself. Is that what you mean? Uh, in some cases, yes. 
They won't necessarily claim the entire restaurant. They'll just take whatever's of value out of the restaurant. Thank you. Welcome. Um, yeah. Um, uh, what is it called? Um, how about collateral? Yeah, so that's, that's a good word. Maybe I should have been using that collateral uh, TG. So when your secured creditors, they have collateral. So yes, they're going to give you a bank loan, but they have collateral for that bank loan. And that collateral uh, can come from your inventories, right, or your equipment or your land. It, basically, you're using your assets as collateral to get a bank loan, right? So that in the event that you go bankrupt, the bank still feels pretty ha feels okay because they're just going to come in and take over your um, and they're going to come and take over your land and sell it, or they're going to come take your equipment and sell it, things like that. Um, yeah, and have you ever watched those um, those repo shows where those massive those massive men come and take people's cars because they're being repossessed because they haven't paid their, their, their car payment. That car, even though you technically own the car, that car is actually used as collateral for the car loan. So if you don't pay your car loan, the bank is just going to come take your car because you're not paying them. Right? So it's, it's like, kind of like collateral. Another maybe not so great example would be when my, my dad's, my dad had a freight brokerage. I think I told you this story. My dad had a freight brokerage and he was frauded and the the company ended up going under, but my dad put a lot of money into into the business before this happened because he needed to put the money in so he could get a contract and the, everything was good except there was no contract. Everything was faked um, because somebody wanted to keep the, his VP of operations wanted to keep his job and really wasn't doing anything. Um, so a company went under. But what was really unfortunate is my dad, the loan that my dad went and got for the business, my dad used my family home as collateral. So when the company went under, bankruptcy when, uh, bankruptcy happened, the bank was like, that's sad. It's okay, though, because we're going to come take your house because that's the collateral we had on that bank loan. So you got to be careful. And if I'm giving advice, uh, use the business's assets as collateral for bank loans if you have to never use personal assets okay that was a big mistake that my dad made um, I understand why he made that decision um, he was making it with the best information possible but at the end of the day my mama she was not so happy <laughs> yes so yeah good job everybody so that was our our, our, our little um, our knowledge check for the week and a bit of a walkthrough on the account types and uh, examples of those. And I wanted to go over the examples and explain what they were. So when we're journalizing or posting to the journal, we can more easily identify what accounts are being affected given a particular uh, transaction. Uh, these are these terms. Uh, well, the, 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 this sheet is uploaded to Blackboard, yes. Is that what you meant? All right. Okay. So yeah, again, this is this is uploaded to Blackboard. Okay. Uh, I put it under week. Uh, sorry, class three and four. Just in case you wanted, uh, it's near the bottom, so you might have to scroll down. No problem. And uh, my throat's getting a little bit dry. So what do you take? What do you say we take a bit of a break right now? We'll take a fifteen-minute break, and then we're going to go into another example of. Uh, journalizing some transactions and then we're going to jump into the uh, the ledger material and then the ledger um, and trial balance worksheet okay so it is now we're going to take a break everybody go get a snack and a glass of water it is now 157 07 8 9 10 11 12 let's be back at 212 how does that sound everybody Okay, well, let's take a break. <laughs> um, yeah, so everybody have a good break. I'm going to turn off my microphone, 
and uh, I'll see everybody back here at 2.12 p.m. Okay? Have a good break, everybody.
All right, welcome back, everybody. Hope everyone had a good break. So what we're going to do now, and I'm going to bring up uh, my file for journal. There we go. Share that. So this is typically what the journal looks like. We showed you this on um, on, on Tuesday. Here, I just want to do a cup. I want to run a couple of uh, examples where we we're going to journalize a couple of transactions before we move on to uh, posting to the ledger uh, and taking a trial balance. Okay, so um, we worked on some last week, but uh, what would be some examples of a business transaction that we can journalize here? So, give me a specific transaction that you'd like to uh, to work with, maybe one that's unclear to you, uh, and give me the amount of the transaction. And then I can we can kind of hash it out to see how we would actually journalize it. Uh, no, we don't need to add to the same journal from last class. No, we're going to be using the uh, the ledger and trial balance worksheet this week. So what's an example of a transaction? What do you think? Okay, so you bought a, a new panini grill. Awesome, Vanessa. How much was that panini grill? Okay, because that will do the grocery next. Absolutely. No, no, that's all good. 800 bucks. Dope. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this, is, this is a good example, but typically when we see these transactions, or the description of these transactions, they're a bit more specific. So let's say, I'm gonna put it in the chat here. Let's say, uh, let's say we purchased a panini grill. Panini, uh, grill for $800, $800 on credit, okay? So I've put the uh, the transaction or the description of the transaction in um, uh, in the chat. Okay, and we'll say we we purchased it on Jan first. Okay. So with this transaction, what are the two accounts that you think are being affected here? So we we peach, uh, we purchased a panini grill. Okay, which would fall under what general account? And we purchased it on credit, so we haven't technically paid for it yet. What two accounts do you think would be affected here? Okay, Danny, Mary Ellen, equipment, absolutely. Panini Grill is definitely a piece of equipment. And Mary Ellen saying pay accounts payable, and yes, I would agree with that, because we have not paid for. When we say on credit, it means we have we have indeed purchased it, but we have not paid cash for that just yet. So absolutely, those are the those are the two accounts. And in terms of good formatting here, which account do we put first on the journal? Exactly, Paul. You put the debit first. Okay, so let's put in the date here. We're going to put Jan first, right? And then the first account was uh, uh, equipment. I'm just going to put equip. Give this a reference number of one, and it was $800. Okay, and we're debiting it to show that the amount of our equipment is going up by $800. And then we're going to credit, exactly, Paul, we're going to credit our accounts payable, or AP. I'm just putting in the short forms because it, it's hard to write here. Uh, and we indent to be the second line to be in good form, and we credit it by $800. Absolutely. And then we get a, a, a description. So uh, to record uh, purchase of equipment or a panini grill, dot, dot, dot. I'm not going to fill in the rest. OK. 
Okay, really awesome job. So, uh, and this would be you posting that to the journal, done and done. Okay, your debits equal your credits, perfect, All right? Um, yeah, Mary Ellen, that could be good, although it is, it is implied with the accounts payable, but being specific in your descriptions is always a good thing. So yes, absolutely. Uh, what a, what's another example of, uh, of a transaction here? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, to who was it? Let's go up here. It's at a grocery. Okay, so we're, we're going to buy um, some inventory. Okay, let's say we're going to purchase. Let's say we purchased uh, $400 worth of uh, food inventory on. You used to buy around 200 per week. Yeah, absolutely. I, I buy the same. <laughs> I always buy, it's so hard shopping for two people sometimes. It's even harder shopping for one. I always purchase too much. I always wait, make way too much food. It's, I, mean, I don't know. So let's say we purchased four hundred dollars worth of food inventory on credit on Jan fourth. Uh, okay, there we go. So there's a transaction. We purchased four hundred dollars worth of food inventory on credit on Jan fourth. What two accounts do we think are being affected here? Okay, Kinsada, I think you mean to say accounts payable. Yeah, no, yeah, but yeah, at least you understand the connection between uh, purchasing something on credit and accounts payable. Good, good. What's the other account that's being affected? What do we all of a sudden have more of? Now that we've paid four hundred dollars, food inventory, absolutely, right? So let's let's uh, let's let's start this. So we put in the date. So Jan, I think it was fourth. And remember, we list our transactions in a chronological order. Okay, uh, the first uh, account that we put here on our, our, our journal is our debit entry, and that would be our food inventory. Okay, this would be our second journal reference, and we were debiting it by 400 bucks because it's going up, right? And then again, we would indent and credit our accounts payable because we paid on credit. So $400 here to show that the, the liability account is increasing. And then we would give a, de a description, and this would be to record uh, the purchase dot, 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 the, to record the purchase of uh, food inventory. Awesome job. Okay, so let's do one more here. Um, what's one that we haven't done before? Oh, okay. Here we go. So I'm, I'm, uh, is that put a thumbs up in the chat? Um, staff works an eight-hour shift. Absolutely, we can do that one. And that's the one I was going to do, actually. <laughs> I'll be enough. Um, okay, so uh, can put a thumbs up in the chat if, if, I, if uh, I'm okay to erase uh, what I have on the screen right here. I just want to clear it out so I can start a new one. Okay, awesome. So I am going to erase this here. Good, good. Okay, so are we supposed to be inputting this into the ledger? Uh, no, not yet. Not yet. We, we are going to work on the ledger, but in, in, a, in a little bit. I, have to, I want to describe what it is first. So uh, to Mary Ellen's um, point, let's say um, for the week, we have incurred, uh, oops, I always find the keyboard on the Microsoft Surface is so small. I keep bumping the wrong, the wrong buttons. So let's say for the week we have incurred a thousand dollars 
worth of wages to staff, but payday is not until next week. Okay, I'm just gonna post this in the chat. So for the week, we have incurred a thousand. Is that an exclamation mark? We've we've incurred a thousand. I apologize. We've incurred $1,000 worth of wages to staff, but payday is not until next week, okay? So in the description of this, we can kind of assume that we have not paid staff, but we still have incurred the expense. Using the matching principle, we have to record this expense when it's happened, okay? So when do you think, well, sorry, uh, what two accounts do you think are being affected here? Absolutely, Vanessa, but which expense? Wages, yes, it is definitely affecting the wage expense 100% because it is a cost that we have to recognize. And it is affecting a, a payables account, but it's affecting our wages a payable. Okay, I'm just going to type that in wages payable. It's going to affect our wages payable because we have incurred that cost, but we have not paid out our wages yet. Okay. Typically speaking, every expense will have a uh, a, a payables counter, uh, sorry, a companion account, right? For example, your wage expense will have a wages payable account. Your interest expense will have an interest payable account. Um, things like that. You only use accounts payable when it's a supplier okay and that's kind of how i think about it i only use um my i only post money that i haven't paid yet to accounts payable when it's money i have not paid to a supplier okay so yeah absolutely so let's let's uh let's start to throw this in okay uh yeah absolutely so let's say this was on jan 3rd okay so the first account we're going to list here is the debit, and in this case, or this uh, this transaction, the amount of the expense is increasing, and we increase expenses on the debit side. So we're going to put our wage expense first. Okay, this is our third transaction, and uh, how much did I say it was? A thousand dollars. So I'm going to put a thousand dollars here in the debit side, right? And then, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to indent the front line there, but you do want to indent the second line. Uh, and you're going to put your wages payable here because we are crediting our wages payable, which is uh, to show that we are increasing that account. And we do that on the, the credit side. Okay. We've done that. It looks to be in good form, except for my first line because I made a mistake. So I'm going to give a description, and that description is to record wages incurred but not paid. And of course, this uh, this description would be a lot smaller if I was typing it in on Excel. <laughs> right? Good. Good, everybody. So I, I'm, I'm getting the feeling that we're getting a lot more comfortable with the journal, which is really awesome, because that's the first step where you're entering information into your accounting system. Okay. Now, because accounting or the accounting cycle is a bit of a process, and you'll start to see that a bit more today once we talk about the ledger, um, to make a mistake in your journal is to make a mistake on your ledger, which also is to make a mistake on your trial balance. What I'm trying to say is making one mistake here will 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 yield inaccurate results at the end of the process, right? Um, think about a calculator. If you want to know what one plus one is, but you put one plus two in your calculator, the end result is going to be bad because the input at the beginning was incorrect. So it's really important when you're journalizing to ask yourself those questions that I was talking about at the beginning of the class. Which accounts are being affected? How are they being affected? 
do I need to debit or credit the account to accurately capture the um, transaction? And do my debits and credits match? Okay. So how does that? We, this is the second uh, the second uh, kind of exercise we've done. Is how how is everybody feeling now? Good. 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 Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So yeah, um, good job everybody. And now I'm going to share this week's content. So I'm going to take this off the screen. Do, do, do. There we go. Share file to be or not to be. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, it's huge. Uh, oh, there we go. So here, not week four. This is class four. Class four. We're going to be posting, uh, in, in this particular content, we're going to be showing how to post to the ledger and, and take a trial balance. Now, there are a lot of moving parts when we do this, okay? When we're, when we're journalizing, we're essentially creating a list of all the transactions and the changes that have happened over a period of time. When we're posting to the ledger, we're taking those individual changes and posting those changes to the specific account in the ledger okay and in the ledger you have all of your accounts and all of the particular uh, transactions that have affected each individual account once you've collected all of that information you can do some really quick math and calculate the balance of the new balance in the account or the new balance of money in the account based on the changes from your journal. Once we have the balance for each one of our accounts on the ledger, we then take that balance and post it to our trial balance, which is right here. Our trial balance is very much like it sounds. We just want to see that all of our debits and credits match. Okay, If we've done our journaling correctly and our uh, posting to our ledger correctly, then our debits and our credits will equal exactly, okay? If not, you need to go back and check and find out where that mistake is, okay? And I'll show you some ways how to do it today. Um, and it's really funny because um, I teach primarily uh, when, we were, when we were on campus, I teach a lot in um, the business building. And it, it's really funny because you can hear some of the accounting students being like, did, my tri did your trial balance balance? Did your balance, did your balance sheet balance? And I'm just like, eh, eh, eh. so I give them tricks to uh, to figure out where their mistake is. Like I don't tell them where they went wrong, but it's it's actually it's actually a pretty easy way to find your mistake. So let's continue. So we're going to describe and understand step three and four in the accounting cycle. We're going to actually post from the general journal to the general ledger. Okay, we're going to tell you what the general ledger is and uh, a little bit more about T-accounts. We're going to show you uh, an illustration of the posting procedure. Uh, I'm going to tell you why we use a chart of accounts, and I've, I've kind of, I think I've explained a little bit about it, but we're going to show you today. We're going to show you how to uh, take a trial balance, and then we're going to show you uh, how there are some ways to find errors in your trial balance and then how some technology can be useful in accounting. So here's that accounting cycle again. At this point, we've, uh, we've done transactional analysis so we can identify whether transactions have occurred or not by asking ourselves whether value was given or received and whether or not there is a source document proving a transaction has occurred. We've just recently gone uh, over journalizing where we record each one of those transactions and how those transactions have changed or affected various counts, accounts. Now we're going to be moving on to step three, which is posting or posting to the general ledger. And then once we've done that, we're going to take an, our account balances and we're going to prepare a trial balance, okay, which is step four. 
So we, we've already talked about this. I'm not going to spend any more time on it. We've already talked about, uh, we've already talked about journalizing. We've talked about the general journal. This is kind of what a, a completed one would look like. So step three, or uh, um, uh, step three, or posting to the general ledger is essentially just transferring information from the journal to the ledger. Okay, in the ledger, you have each of your accounts, and you post the specific changes from each transaction to the respected uh, or the um, yeah the the specific account, so that we can calculate the ending balance of those accounts to take a trial balance. Then we take that trial balance to make sure all of our debits equal our credits. And it's really important uh, that we do that so that we make sure that most of the all the information that we're including in our financial statements is accurate um, in that we're following um, we're following the, some of the basic accounting equations. For example, sales uh, profit equals sales minus costs, and assets always equal liabilities plus equity. If your trial balance does not balance, it means either that your balance sheet is not going to balance, or it means that your, your profit is either going to be overstated or understated, all of which are bad and means we've made a mistake. More about the general ledger. Uh, the general ledger is also known as the book of final entry. Okay, um, this is again where all the balances of your accounts live. Uh, it contains the group of accounts that uh, compose or comprise your organization's accounting system. So all of the accounts that you have um, in your accounting system live in your general ledger. Okay. Um, accounting software uh, pretty much posts the general ledger automatically, okay, because it's a fantastic stuff, technology. However, Excel, if you don't want to buy the technology or you're starting a small business or even a medium-sized business, Excel can be formatted to do the exact same thing. And that's what we've done with your assignments so that when you're done with this course, if you don't want to purchase your accounting software, you just take the templates that I'm giving you for your assignments, and you have your you have the knowledge to do accounting, and you've got the template. You are your accounting software. So here are your T accounts. Okay, the reason they're called T accounts is well, they look like T's. Okay, the T accounts that you're going to find in the general ledger worksheet and templates that I have for you. They look a little bit different, but they operate in the same way, okay? Each T account is a separate uh, account. So let's say this one was cash, okay? This could be accounts receivable. This could be inventories or food inventory, okay? This could be accounts payable. This could be wages payable. This could be sales. This could be wages expense, Ooh, wages expense. This could be common stock. Uh, and this could be, uh, I don't know, what uh, retained earnings. So it has all of your accounts that you use in your accounting system in the ledger. On the left hand side of the T, okay, is your debit call, uh, your debit column, and the right hand side is your credit column, okay. So what you're doing when we journalized, we listed all of the transactions and all the changes to various accounts. When we're posting to the ledger, we're taking all of those changes and posting them to the accounts that they're affecting. For example, let's say on our general journal, we had four different transactions that affected cash in various ways, okay? For example, we had some sales that increased cash and we had some costs that decreased cash. We post all of those transactions to the cash, 
uh, general ledger account. And then based on those changes, the increases and decreases, we can calculate the ending balance of that account, right? Each T account in the ledger is essentially just a list of all of the changes that are affecting those accounts. For example, um, let's say, I'm gonna type it in the chat here. Let's say you have $500 in, yeah, Mary, that, that, that's actually a really, I'm gonna do another personal example, but uh, to Mary Ellen's comment here, uh, yeah, exactly. When you look online at your bank account, you on the left hand side you've got with uh, you know you've got withdrawals you've got um, you've got uh, deposits and things like that and then the difference between the two gives you your account balance right um, exactly uh, so let's say you've got right now I'm going to type this in the chat right now you have 500 in your bank account okay let's also say you got paid a thousand dollars, but um, have also purchased two hundred. Oops, I keep pressing the wrong button. Two hundred dollars worth of food, cash, and five hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin cash. There we go. What is your bank account balance? So take, a, take a look at the question in the chat. Okay, so right now you got 500 bucks in your bank account. Let's say you got paid a thousand dollars, okay? But you have also purchased $200 worth of food in cash and $500 worth of Bitcoin in cash. It was a bad day for Bitcoin, I would also add. And for $500, you will not be buying very much Bitcoin, but more than the other day. Okay. So based on those changes, what's what's your account balance here? $800. I gotta I gotta do this too. Yeah, I get the same thing, right? <clears throat> the answer here is $800. The $500 of Bitcoin is coming out because you're purchasing the $500 of Bitcoin. So the reason we know this is because we, we know what the beginning balance of the account was. We know what, what amount of money is going into the account or increasing in the account. And we also know what money is coming out of the account, right? Based on the, the sum of those two things, we can calculate the, end, uh, the ending balance of that account. And that's exactly all we're doing in our general ledger is we're just gathering all the changes for each individual account and calculating the ending balance. Okay, um, I'm going to share a white screen here, a whiteboard, just to show what that would kind of look like on your T account. Okay, so you got your your cash T account, right? Uh, you got your debit, you got your credit. Okay, and this is just this is just a rough example. Okay, so you had a five hundred dollar beginning balance, and you deb that's on the debit side because um, balances on your your financial accounts usually or all actually I should say always have a balance on the the side that they increase on. Okay, so asset accounts have have balances on their debit side. Liabilities and equity accounts have balances on their credit side, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, you started off with a five hundred dollar beginning balance. Okay, yes, Catherine. Hi, David. Sorry, I just didn't do a very good job of interpreting that. Can you just repeat what you just said about the the opening balance? 
Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So the five hundred dollars here is your beginning balance, or uh, was the amount of money in your bank account uh, before all of the changes uh, that are about to happen? So it's kind of the the beginning balance. It's the closing balance from the previous period, which is your opening balance uh, here. Or we can simply think of this as this is the amount of money that was left over in the account before we make the new changes. So it, and it's a debit balance, okay? But we also got paid a thousand dollars, and based on that, we want to increase the money amount of money in the account. So we would post that to the uh, debit side of the ledger account, okay, to show that it's increasing. However, we purchased two hundred dollars worth of food in cash. And we know that in order, our cash account is decreasing by $200. So we would show or post this on the, the credit side, show that the amount of money or there's a change that's going to decrease our cash account. And then we bought $500 worth of Bitcoin in cash. Okay, so our cash account is going down again. So we would credit the account by $500. So now we've got two sides debit and credit with two, um, two pieces of information, okay? Um, what you do here is you add up both sides and then you subtract them. So right here, and this, this, is, this isn't in necessarily good format, I'm just kind of showing you the, uh, the arithmetic here. Right here, you've got $1,500 in total debits and on the credit side, you have $700 in total credits. Based on the two, you take $1,500 minus $700, and you are left over with a closing balance of $800. And that is the balance of your cash account. It's also the balance that you are going to take and post to your trial balance. So essentially, your general ledger accounts are just a, um, ways to record all of the changes that are happening in that account. Okay. Does anybody have any questions or maybe there's something I can clarify a bit better? Good, and if you do have some questions, uh, totally cool. I've got some illustrations that may do a better job of showing you the, 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 the transfer of that information. I'm going to share a file, there we go, share, just trying to find it, I've done that, there we go. I don't know what is it what it is about Microsoft Teams, but even when I have it closed, I still get messages and they pop up, so I'm sorry if you heard that. Okay, so here's that illustration that I was talking about. Okay, on the left-hand side here, you have your general journal. And the right-hand side, you have several um, uh, general ledger accounts. So what you're doing in transferring the information is just taking the individual changes. I would need to sign out. Okay, that makes sense, actually. I just thought by closing the program, anyway. I feel I, This is why I, I feel like I'm always connected. It's just like, if it's not emails. It's the, it's the Microsoft Teams continuously pinging. Um, so here we're just transferring transferring the individual changes to the specific account that it's changing, right? And we would list all of the changes that are happening to cash under the cash account, all of the changes from the journal that are happening to the accounts receivable account to the accounts receivable, and so on and so forth. Okay. Okay, and the chart of accounts. Okay, so your chart of accounts, uh, you have a chart of accounts on your assignment number one, is a sequential listing of a business's financial accounts that can be found in the general ledger. Okay, so it's all the accounts that you have access to or have used in the past. Um, if you don't, if there's an account that's not showing up there, you can add one in, absolutely. Uh, you have the ability on most accounting softwares to add in a new account. And it facilitates finding ledgering accounts 
during journalizing and posting and preparing financial statements. Okay, it also helps with issue identification because you look at a business transaction, you're like, okay, what, what two accounts is this transaction affecting? You can look at your chart of account to remind you of the financial accounts that you can put that money in. Okay, um, and then yeah, as new accounts become relevant, uh, you should those accounts should be added to both the journal ledger. Uh, and the, um, sorry, I didn't include it here, the chart of accounts. So uh, generally the chart of accounts is just a list of all um, the accounts that you have access to or can post financial information to. Uh, typically speaking, I, I'll take this a little bit further. Typically speaking, to be in good form, your chart of accounts needs to be, the sequence of the listing of your accounts needs to go in terms of uh, assets, liabilities, equity, revenue accounts, expense accounts, and then temporary accounts. However, for our purposes, um, and because I've changed things over the, uh, over the course of the last couple of years, your chart of accounts will not be in proper sequential order, but that's, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to change it. And here is just uh, an example of what one would look like. Right? You've got all of the accounts that you can possibly post to, right? Um, yeah. Do, do, do. And then sometimes your chart of accounts can be broken down by category and account code, okay? For our purposes, we're not going to use account codes. Uh, what if the data is not given? Sue Young, uh, how do you mean? What data? Or which at that I should say. Um, this one right here. Um, what if that's not given? Well, uh, if it if it will it'll be given on most accounting softwares because you when you when you're posting a transaction you select it that that transact you select out from an existing list. If you're doing it by hand, you kind of have to create your own chart of accounts, okay? And you would do that just by using the most logical account name. For example, in a lot of the um, tutorials that we've done, we've we've been posting uh, to the journal or to financial accounts without a chart of account. So you'd be able to do that as well. Uh, but for assignment number one and assignment number two, uh, you're given your chart of accounts. It's it's in the worksheet for assignment number one. Let's see, I'll, uh, I'll bring it up just in case. Okay, awesome. Um, so yeah, sometimes you can you you can break it down per category like this uh, and give it account codes. In QuickBooks, uh, it does have account codes that you can reference really quickly. But then again, if you're doing this by pen and, pen and paper, uh, you don't really need the account codes. Uh, and here's an example of the calculation or calculating the balance of a general ledger account, right? So this is for our cash account, okay? The account code is 101, okay? On the left-hand side here of the T account is the debit side. On the right-hand side is your credit side. Within each of those sides, you have a reference number or date. That is the reference number to that particular transaction in the journal. So you can see, uh, if you know, you can look at your general ledger and be like, oh, why am I debiting 250,000 on what is that September 1st? Well, I can go back and look at that particular transaction on the ledger, or sorry, on, on the journal to see, to remind me of what happened, right? So there's reference numbers, okay? And then on the credit hand side, there's the same thing. These are all reference numbers as to where those transactions stem from, from the journal itself, okay? And then once you've recorded all the changes to the accounts, you take the totals, okay? And then the difference between the two sides will give you the balance for the account. So in this case, $355,000 minus $185,526 gives us an ending cash balance 
of $169,474. Okay, and uh, as I had mentioned before, when you're taking a balance for any particular account, the balance should always be on the side of the account where it increases. For example, debit uh, in your cash account, which is a live, uh, which is an asset, assets increase on the debit side. It will always, always, always have a debit balance. Okay, and this balance is what you transfer to your trial balance, your TB. Okay, so it's fairly uh, good illustration. Does anybody help? Uh, have any have any questions I can help answer, or um, uh, maybe there's something I can clarify here? We'll put a thumbs up in the chat if that was fairly straightforward. Okay. Uh, Mary Ellen, so liability accounts would have a debit balance as well because they decrease on that side. The uh, typically, uh, maybe maybe I misspoke here, but um, the balance normally appears on the side where that account increases. So uh, cash has cash increases on the debit side, so it has a debit balance. So liability, um, awesome. Yeah, so liability would have a credit balance. Do, do, do. So taking a trial balance, okay? Yeah, Ryan, it, it kind of is, or at least it's if you've done your accounting, if you followed the rules of debits and credits, you'll 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 the uh, it's fairly uh, intuitive, right? One side's gonna be bigger than the other. You take the bigger side, you minus the smaller size, smaller side, and then whatever's left on the smaller side is your balance, or sorry, on the larger side is your balance. Joss. So taking the trial balance, which is step four, it's probably the easiest step. All you're doing is transferring information or balances from your from your ledger to your uh, to your trial balance, and your trial balance is used to check the accuracy of your debit and credit balances in your general ledger uh, at the end of an accounting period. Okay, it's not the final step, but it is the first time we're checking for accuracy in our accounting cycle. Okay. The trial balance lists all of the general ledger accounts with their current balances as of the last day of the accounting period, and those numbers will eventually uh, will eventually make up financial statements. But we still have to make adjustments and closing entries. Okay, um, and if our debits and our credits on our trial balance balance, then Yahtzee, we've done everything correctly for, or at least mostly correctly. There can still be some errors. Here's what a trial balance looks like. It lists all of your accounts, okay? Typically in order of, typically in order of your chart of accounts, but in, in the event that it doesn't, it's not a big deal. You list all of the accounts and their balance in the correct debit or credit column based on the balances in the ledger. And then you add up all the balances, and if they balance or they equal each other, then you've done it correctly. Your trial balance balances. This is a good thing. Um, in some cases, your trial balance will not balance. Um, there are some ways to uh, find it. Okay. Um, the easiest way, and I don't, I honestly don't know what the rule of nine is. Okay, the easiest way to find the um, the an error in um, in a trial balance, if there's if they if the your debits and your credits don't equal, take the uh, take the bigger side and then subtract the smaller side or the smaller number, and then go looking for the difference because it could be it could be that you didn't post a particular transaction from your journal to your ledger, or that you didn't uh, um, take into consideration that amount of money when calculating the, calculating the balance in your ledger, okay? 
Um, like I'd say eight times out of 10, if there's a problem in your trial balance, uh, doing the difference between your debits and credits will typically find it, okay? However, um, if, and that would be an example of finding a, a single error on your, in your accounting cycle. If you, there are multiple errors, uh, either in, uh, when you're doing your journal or when you're, um, uh, when you're ledgering, then it becomes more difficult to find. It's a lot easier to find one mistake than five because five will compound uh, those five mistakes. It's, it's hard to find those five mistakes because they're all mixed together, right? It's hard to piece them apart. Um, what else would I say here? Um, and then remember to post uh, the general ledger balances to the correct column on the trial balance. Okay, I found in some cases uh, students will mix up the columns and uh, or the balances and that will throw your trial balance out of um, out of whack. Okay. Do, do, do. Uh, computers in accounting. <laughs> this uh, textbook is super old. In fact, like this, uh, this book was written when I was like 12 or what, thir six, six, 16, 17. 17 when this book was written. Um, what is it called? Uh, accounting software is great. It, it's so great. Uh, it helps you do your accounting quite quickly. Okay. However, you still need to know the ins and out of the accounting cycle so you know what to produce. You need to know the rules and you need to know what you're looking at. If there's a problem in your accounting, okay, based on, or if there's a problem on your financial statements, your knowledge of the accounting process will help you know where to start looking for that problem or how to solve that problem. So um, computers are great, but it's still really important to have this working accounting knowledge uh, to use the, the, the technology. But also if you want to do this by pen and paper, uh, totally fine. Uh, and you'll be able to do that. You'll be able to do the books for a medium sized business. Do, do, do. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, the computers or the QuickBooks is, is um, it makes the accounting process pretty quick and some errors can be found pretty quickly or easily if you have that working knowledge of accounting. Okay, so we're not going to do this particular workshop. What we're going to do instead is first we're going to take a break because I'm starting to lose my voice and then I'm going to, we're going to open up the general ledger and trial balance worksheet from this uh, this class's learning materials. I'm going to show you how to start processing uh, or moving information to the general ledger, taking a balance and uh, moving that information to the trial balance. Okay. So it's three o'clock now. Let's take a break. Uh, let's be back at uh, 315. Okay. Everybody go uh, get a glass of water. Maybe even a coffee because this, this might be a little finicky. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you at 3.15. Have a good break, everybody.
All right, welcome back everybody. I hope everyone had a good break. So now we're going to spend the rest of class going through the worksheet that is posted to this class's working materials, uh, sorry, uh, learning materials. I believe the worksheet's called uh, on Blackboard. It is called, I will tell you, the Journal, Ledger, and Trial Balance Worksheet. So there's two ways you can do this. Um, I do want you to complete this worksheet, okay, so you can follow along with me while I'm doing it, or you can do it later after class or tomorrow and have it submitted by Friday, this Friday, at by midnight for participation grades, okay? Either way you want to do it, okay? If you want to do it later, okay, uh, there is a video posted of me doing a bit of a tutorial um, to, on Blackboard, okay? Um, you're unable to open it again. Yeah, Paul, you might have to download, um, you might have to go on to your Office 365 account through through the college and, um, and download Excel. Let me see if I can find it for you right now. Office uh, 365 GBC. There we go, current students. Because you, because you um, what is it called? Uh, yeah, okay, Joseph, you can do that as, as well. I'm not really sure. Um, it's taking a, a while to load up here. There we go. Um, I'm just going to copy this into the chat bar. Go. There we go. Um, there, there's a, uh, when you go to that website, there's an area where you can download the Excel. So, Paul, uh, maybe what I would suggest is just watching for now and maybe completing it after you're able to open the file with Office 365. Okay. Um, I do have one quick question before we continue. Your class with Dr. G, I believe you're taking research right now, is that a seven week course or a 14 week course? Seven. Okay, just wanted to double check. Uh, and Ryan, uh, I'm not quite sure how you drag it, um, but Joseph seemed to to know quite a bit about it, and download the file and drag it into Office 365. Um, maybe you could uh, connect with Joseph and um, and 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 go from there. Otherwise, uh, uh, Ryan, please just follow along. And then when you're able to open up the worksheet, uh, you can complete it later. Does that sound okay, Ryan? Okay. And uh, Danny, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, the seven week, uh, this and then next. Yeah, no, and we, we found, uh, we know who your professor for uh, managerial accounting will be. It's going to be Professor Dado. He's really awesome. This is the general ledger and trial balance worksheet. Yes, correct. Yeah, the, the name of the, the Excel file is different than the name on Blackboard. Yes, yes. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. And when I share my screen, I can't really see what your comments are in the chat. So um, I'm going to take periodic breaks from completing this worksheet. And then I'm going to come back to the chat to see if you have any questions. So first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to give you the layout of the worksheet, okay, uh, and the different tabs within the worksheet. And then I'll come back to this, the chat to see if you have any questions about the formatting. Oh, yeah, sure. That would actually, uh, that would work, Vanessa. Yeah, if, if one of you... Um, if one of you wants to throw on your mic and uh, let me know our questions in the chat, um, do we have a volunteer, or do you just want to uh, turn your mic on and uh, if you have a question? What do you think? Okay, perfect, Vanessa. There we go. Absolutely. So if you have a question, uh, while I'm completing the worksheet, uh, please put it in the chat and then Vanessa will put on her microphone and let me know what the question is. Okay, does that sound good everybody? Put a, put a thumbs up in the chat if you're ready to go.
Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm going to share an application. Before I do that, uh, okay. Yeah, I'm just I'm just going to share. Okay. Application screen window, it's not showing up. And so go undo files, oops. Application screen window, why are you not showing up? Go. There we go. Okay. So when you first open up this, uh, well, first, when you first open up this worksheet, uh, on the bottom hand side, you got three tabs. Okay, your journal, you've got your general ledger, and your trial balance. I just realized that in your trial balance on your sheet, it's already filled in. Okay, so delete that. Okay, and then follow along with me. You just just highlight everything, and then uh, you push delete. Okay. So. Again, this is your trial balance. It's got a list of all of your accounts. It's got your, your, your balances for your accounts, debits or credit, and then it's got a reference number, but we won't be putting in reference numbers uh, for this particular example. We also have our journal. Okay, so we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five. We have five transactions that have been posted to the, to the journal for us with reference numbers and with debit and credit amounts, okay? In fact, um, these transactions are the transactions that we went over or spoke about uh, uh, last class, okay? Uh, and then you have your general ledger. So this is what your general ledger looks like. Uh, for every one of your accounts, you've got a general ledger account, so this is for cash. And you have, this is where you post all of the transactions that will affect your cash account. You put the date in, you put a description from the journal, you put in the reference number from the journal uh, post, and then you put the, the debit or credit change, okay? It's important to note that in these accounts that I'm showing you here, okay, there's no beginning balance, and that's perfectly fine. We're just starting from scratch, just to show you the process of transfer, transferring information from the journal to the ledger, and then your balances from the ledger to the trial balance, okay? So um, I'm gonna show you how to do this in a bit of a methodical manner, okay? Um, there are um, some, uh, what is it called? Ways that we can make sure that uh, we're doing this and we're not missing any information. So we just go down line by line. Okay. Sorry, Professor. We yeah. have a question from Mary Ellen. Does that stay in order? Uh, they should be in order. Yeah. Uh, well, I should say that they be in chronological order. Good question. So here on January uh, 1st, we recorded the purchase of equipment with cash. Okay. And so we've debited cash by, uh, sorry, debited equipment by $3,500 with a journal reference of one. So what we wanna do here, what I like to do is I copy the description. So I've copied the description of the transaction, which is to record the purchase of equipment with cash. I look at the reference number, which is one and the amount, okay? Now I go, to the general ledger. I find the equipment account, which is right here. I put in the date of this particular change, which was January 1st. I paste in the, sorry. Oh, I put in the description. So to record the purchase of equipment. Oh, the reference number was one and we're debiting the account by 300, $3,500, okay? We have just successfully posted the first change 
from our journal to our ledger. Okay, so now I go back. Okay, and the next account that was being changed here was cash by uh, another by the the credit here was another three uh, three thousand five hundred. So I'm going to try and copy this again. There we go. And I'm going to go to my ledger to my cash account, which I believe is at the top. There we go. I put in the date, so January 1st. Perfect. The description, and it won't let me put in the description. But the description was to purchase equipment. Let's put it wrong. There we go. The reference here was one, and it was a credit entry of 3,500. There we go. Done and done. Back to the journal, and this transaction has been fully transferred from the journal to the ledger. Okay, and that's the process that we're doing, right? We're just transferring um, the information from one uh, book of entry to another. So going down here, um, we have on January 2nd, we purchased uh, food inventories in cash. So we purchased $1,000 of food inventory, which is the debit. Um, we used cash, uh, and we credited the account by $1,000. And the reference number here was two. So we're going to go find our food inventory account, which is right here on the, the general ledger. I'm going to put in the date which was of the change, which was January 2nd. There we go. And this description was we purchased food inventory. So to uh, record the purchase of food inventory. Go. Bigger. The reference number was two. Oh, sorry, yep, two. And it was a debit entry because we're increasing our inventory by how much was it? It was one thousand dollars. So we put a thousand dollars in there. There we go. Perfect. Go back to our journal. And the second entry was cash. And we're crediting cash by a thousand dollars. So I go back to my ledger, go back up to cash on January 2nd. There we go. Uh, to, uh, put in the description to purchase food inventory. Okay. The, the journal reference was two. And we're going to be crediting the account by a thousand dollars because we used a thousand dollars to purchase the food inventory. Back to our journal and now this transaction has been fully transferred or captured in our journal which is great. So we're going to move over to the next transaction on January 3rd. We've recorded that we purchased beverage inventory of $450 using $400, $450 with cash okay, with a journal reference of three. So we want to first record our beverage inventory change. I go to my general ledger and I find beverage inventory, which is right here. This happened on January 3rd. Okay, and the description I'm going to put here is to record the purchase of beverage inventory. There we go. Let's put it again. The reference number from the journal was three. And we're debiting the account by, I think it was $450. Okay. And then we've done that. Go back. That's captured, $450, which is good. Debit, perfect. And then we want to credit the cash account by $450 because we use cash to buy that uh, food inventory. So go back up to cash. Put in the date, January 3rd. Perfect. Uh, to and the description is to purchase beverage inventory. All right. The reference number was three, and we were crediting the account with four hundred fifty dollars. Perfect. Back to the journal, and this transaction is fully captured in the ledger, which is great as well. We also move to January. Now we have to move to January fourth. Uh, where it looks like we generated some sales. So daily sales, we recorded daily sales of $8,500, and it was all in cash, which is which is good, right? Uh, the reference number was four. So we go to our general ledger, go to our cash accounts, 
put in the date, so Jan 4th. And then we're going to put to record daily sales. Okay, reference number was four. And we debited the, we're debiting our cash account by $8,500. $8, Perfect. Go back to our journal. And we're to complete this transaction in the ledger, we have to credit our food sales account by the same amount. Okay, so we go to our ledger, find our food sales, perfect, right here. Put in the date, January 4th. Okay, oh, there we go, January 4th. Uh, the description here was to record daily sales, daily food sales, I should say. The reference number was four, and we are crediting the account by $8,500. Okay. Now, we have fully captured this transaction in our ledger. Lastly, we need to uh, take care of the transaction that happened on January 5th, which was recording cost of food sold for the week, okay, where we debited the expense account cost of food sold by $570, and we credited our food inventory to show the decrease by uh, $570, okay? So, uh, and the reference number here was, was five. So I'm gonna go to my cost of food sold, 570, which is right here. This happened on Jan 5th. Description is to record weekly cost of food sold. It might, uh, Food, cost of food sold could be daily. I forget. Reference number was five. And how much was it for? Uh, five hundred seventy dollars. So we're going to debit the cost of food count, cost of food sold count by five hundred seventy dollars. Perfect. And then lastly, we need to credit our food inventory count by the same. So five hundred seventy dollars. So let's find our cost of food sold. Sorry, our food inventory account. Here we go. So on January 5th, there we go. Wanted to record weekly cost of food sold. Oh, and a reference number of five. And we are crediting the account by $570. Perfect. Here we go. So here, uh, now what we've done, because we've we've completely transferred all of the information from our journal to our ledger, we've completed step three in the accounting process, which is posting that information to the ledger. Step number four of the accounting cycle, or accounting process, is calculating the balances of each of our accounts and transferring to them to the trial balance to make sure they balance. So that's what we're gonna do right now, but first, we're gonna go to our general ledger, and we're going to calculate the balance of our accounts based on uh, the changes, okay? So here, uh, there's two ways you can do this, okay? You can sum up each of the columns, so your debit and your credit, and give totals here, and then give the ending balance, or you can just take your debits and then minus all of your credits, because it will have a debit balance because it's an asset account which increases on the debit side. So it has a debit, um, Based on these changes right here, we have our cash account has a debit balance of $3,550. We then come down to our equipment account. Okay, uh, we have only one transaction here, a debit transaction for $3,500. Because there's an, an imaginary zero here, we just keep it as a debit balance of $3,500 because that's the only change. Now to our food inventory. Okay, we've got two entries. Uh, because food inventory is an asset account, it's gonna have a debit balance. So we take all of our debits, subtract all of our credits, and it will give us a $430 food inventory balance in the account. Let's come down here a bit. Our beverage inventory, we don't have, we only have one entry. So our balance, and because it's an asset account, is going to be $450. Uh, as a debit balance. Then we come down here to our food sales. Again, only one entry. 
Uh, it's a credit entry, so it's going to have a credit balance of $8,500. And then lastly, our cost of food sold, only one entry, and it's a debit entry. So we're going to have a debit balance of $570. Again, uh, cost of food sold is an expense account, so it will have a debit balance. And now we've calculated all of the balances for the accounts in our general ledger. Now that this is complete, we can fully uh, start to transfer this information to the trial balance to make sure our debits and our credits match and that we've followed the correct rules. So let's do that now. So our cash account had a balance, a debit balance of 3,550. So I go to my trial balance, go to the cash account, and put in $3,550 on the debit side. Okay. I then go back to my general ledger, go down to the next account, which is equipment, and it has a debit balance of $3,500. Go to my trial balance here, find my equipment right here. And what was the balance? It was $3,500. So I put in $3,500 in the debit side. Very good. Now I go down to the next account, which is our food inventory, which has a closing balance of a debit 430. So find our food inventory. I put in the debit balance of 430. There we go. Just make sure that it's right. Yes, it is. Um, and then I go down to my beverage inventory. It has a debit balance of 450. So liquor inventory or beverage has a debit balance of 450. There we go. go back to my ledger. Food sales had a, a closing credit balance of $8,500. So go to my food sales here. Boop, 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 boop. Food sales, credit balance, $8,500. Go. And when you're doing this, when you start to see a difference between the two, that's perfectly fine. It's not going to balance until you get to the very end anyway. So don't let that freak you out. Uh, then I'm going to come to my cost of food sold, which has a debit balance of $570. So I'm going to go to my cost of food sold right here, and I'm going to put in 570. There we go. And going back to the ledger, I have no more information to put in. I've captured all of my uh, ledgered accounts balances well. Go back to my trial balance, and I look at the bottom, and boom, they balance. This is what you want. You want your trial balance to balance. Um, when it balances, everything was done well. You followed your debit and credit rules well. Uh, you followed uh, double entry accounting and the logic for the creation of your income statement in your balance sheet. And that's, uh, that's the worksheet. Um, that is you taking your journal, uh, posting to the ledger, and taking a trial balance. And this is essentially what you're being asked to do for assignment number one. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and come back to see if you have any questions. Go. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Um, I, uh, I. I'm kind of. I, I. I'm not sure if it's like. I don't know. I'm very detail oriented, and I like everything exactly the way it's supposed to be. Right. I'm, I have a very analytical personality, so I find doing that quite satisfying. I, and seeing that the balance is is actually nice as well. Yeah, because I've in my experience, I've gone through. I've made many trial balances through my education, and they didn't always balance. <laughs> so what do you think? How was that? Fairly straightforward, fun to watch, great. And this is, this is really good practice for your first assignment, because I, what I just did is what to do for your first assignment. That's pretty straightforward. Yeah, as long as you get the logic and the rules, then every that th they tell you exactly what to do. It's just a process. It's pretty exhilarating, just, um, Yeah, it's just it's uh, it's a process that you follow that has rules. There's it's pretty um, there's steps, and as long as you follow the rules, it is it's 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 well it, it's good, right? So yeah, good job everybody. I'm happy everyone was uh, able to follow with that. 
And um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, that's all I have for this week. So we get a bit of an early start to our weekend, which is fantastic. But I'm wondering if anybody has any questions uh, before we conclude the class. Yes, Joseph. <clears throat> Hi there. Um, I was just wanted to confirm we're just dropping off that uh, that general ledger worksheet. Is that on Blackboard or on Teams? Sorry about that. On, you may have mentioned that. On Blackboard. And it might be my fault. Just let me double check that I've got a Dropbox. No, yeah, no worries. I, no worries. Yeah, so under the weekly learning materials, Perfect. there's a. There's a okay, yeah. thanks a lot. No problem. Right. Any other, any other questions? The the Dropbox for your worksheet for this week is under the class four learning materials on Blackboard. No problem. And if you do, uh, so it should be submitted, yes, Friday by, by midnight. Absolutely. And uh, that's assignment number one. OK, no problem. So next week, we're going to be completing steps five and six of the accounting cycle, which is making adjustments or adjusting entries. And sometimes those can be kind of confusing. Uh, but the rules of debits and credits and the accounts still apply. It's just a matter we have to calculate some stuff. So there will be some some arithmetic next week in our in a Tuesday class. And then we're going to close the books and start to create financial statements in, in a very similar way that we did it today. So again, I'm going to show you the method. I'm going to show you how to calculate some of these things. And um, and after next week, you should be able to complete your assignment number two. OK, and um, Yep. Sorry. Um, and then uh, what's this week two, week three? And then in week four, the following week, you do have your midterm. But I'll touch more on your midterm uh, next week on Tuesday. OK. So if, if there are no uh, other questions, uh, I have a great weekend. Have a great long weekend. Enjoy your I think it's Victoria Day. Enjoy your Victoria Day. And uh, we'll see you on Tuesday. No problem. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks for a great class. Yes, Marianne. Yeah, sorry. I just had one quick question. So the um, the worksheet that we filled out just now, it's getting put into the Dropbox for class four. Oh. And then the assignment um, is due next week. Yes, by oh. Sunday. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No problem.